And it was the longest budget speech by an Indian finance minister, Nirmala Sitharaman. She began by th thanking the people of India, who she said validated the two goals for India's future, national security and economic growth. She said India is on track to become a $3 trillion economy and that it has all it takes to become a $5 trillion economy in the next few years. To make that happen, a 10-point vision for a new India was also laid out. It was a budget focused on boosting infrastructure and foreign investment. But let's begin how this budget affects the common man and woman of India. Starting with the salaried class, Nirmala Sitharaman kept income tax slab rates unchanged but announced a slew of new income tax proposals. So individual income tax would only apply to incomes of above 5 lakh rupees per annum. However, the finance minister said those in highest income bracket need to contribute more to national development and raised surcharge on individual income of 2 to 5 crore rupees and over 5 crore rupees by 3% and 7% respectively. For those who are not part of the salaried class, meanwhile pension benefit is to be extended to around 3 crore retail traders and shopkeepers. It's only for those with an annual turnover less than 1.5 crore rupees. Now under Pradhan Mantri Karam Yogi Mandhan scheme, in more relief, an additional deduction of 1.5 lakh rupees on interest on loans borrowed under affordable housing was also introduced. Well, those purchasing affordable house will get tax relief up to 3.5 lakhs on interest paid. And we are joined by our first global guest, Richard Rosso, expert of US-India policy studies. A very, a very good evening to Mr. Rosso, first of all, from a point of view of an industrialist or maybe from foreign investor, do you think there was something for you this time in budget? There was. Uh, you know, I do look at it, of course, uh, very closely from the U.S. viewpoint. Uh, we've got a trade fight happening right now, but uh, and so keeping a close eye on what happens on customs duties was a top priority for me. But you're right, on foreign investment, we actually saw a, a number of announcements in there that I think uh, should warm the hearts of investors, uh, talking about insurance, uh, civil aviation, uh, carving off insurance brokerages, which is very different from operating, uh, you know, uh, an insurance firm. Um, so, so it is good to see that uh, they do plan on moving fast because we saw five years ago the Modi government announced uh, planned FDI reforms in multiple sectors and concluded all of those reforms within the first year in office. So, sometimes seeing these things in the budget, you never know what the plan is and how soon. But uh, they have a good track record of implementing FDI reforms when they announce them in a budget speech. But what all was left out, Mr. Uh, Rosso, what all should have done as well, apart from all these measures which are taken already? Well, there wasn't a lot of clarity. I mean, with insurance, for instance, uh, it's still held at 49% FDI. Are they going to go all the way up to 100%? Are they going to reduce these uh, controls on local management control that they implemented, uh, the Modi government did? Um, uh, so there, there are multiple other sectors, uh, some areas of gambling and lottery, uh, certainly a whole slew of foreign investment regulations related to um, uh, different models of retail. They did talk about relaxing somewhat the procurement norms for single brand retail, but many other, uh, such as brick and mortar, uh, FDI in, in multi-brand retail, um, there still are limitations across the board on there. So uh, there are other opportunities, I think, to move on FDI re restrictions if they choose to in the coming five years, even from those that were mentioned specifically in the budget. But the Indian stock markets clearly did not favor a uh, number of uh, announcements. They were not rejoiced by all of them. So how do you see Indian markets giving, the, giving a thumbs down to the budget this time? Well, you know, as I go through the documents, and of course, it's still very early in my time, but uh, as I went through the documents this morning before coming on uh, your, your program, you know, you just saw repeatedly uh, a commitment to uh, rural, uh, uh, rural development. A uh, number of uh, projects that they began uh, over the last five years that they want to try to take to implementation. Uh, one personally that I think for India's social development that I think is quite exciting is, you know, finally taking a serious drive at delivering clean drinking water to the masses, which I think is a huge gap and one that I hope the Modi government can take on as strongly as they did some of these other initiatives on cooking gas and, and uh, electrification that they've done in the last five years. So, you know, top line, you saw you know, issues of rural development clearly took priority. Uh, when you look at uh, uh, SOPs that were given out to the corporate sector, a lot of that was geared towards uh, small business and startups, which has been a great area for job generation, um, but not as much necessarily for the large corporates that would publicly traded, so uh, a little bit less for the publicly traded firms. 
Um, so, so you did see some, I, I think, interesting initiatives there, those that are very good for India, but maybe not as good for the corporate market. Uh, this other, you know, interesting change, too, where they're talking about increasing the mandatory minimum of uh, public shareholding for publicly traded firms, uh, right. increasing that from 25 percent to 35 percent, too. Um, you know, you look at areas like that and, um, you know, if, if companies are forced to make uh, dramatic changes to their shareholding structure uh, by government mandate rather than by choice. Um, right. so, so I think for large companies, uh, it's kind of a mix. All right, thank you, Mr. Rosso, for getting us all these de details and important perspective. And meanwhile, I'm joined by another guest, Joita Bhattacharji, Senior Fellow, Observer Richer Research Foundation. Well, this time, um, uh, social stock exchange, well, something, this is a new term we have heard. Can it explain to our viewers what does it mean and how will it benefit maybe them or some other social sector schemes? Uh, definitely, I think um, if, you total, if you look into the overall budget, it's very balanced and I would say it's a continuation of Modi governments and it's a very, it is looking into a very long term view. So it is not something have come but it was the continuation so that way and it always been a focus of sabka saad sabka bikas so and social sector really comes in a much bigger way so this is very innovative process of social sector stock exchange where we can really boost the social sector development needs a lot of development and uh, in financing also so that way this is a very forward looking step that has been taken forward this means they can be listed on stock exchanges they can uh. sell their share on stock exchanges but why will somebody be interested in buying shares in these uh, social stock exchanges I think it's very important because the government is also looking into how we can boost the economy and understanding our present context. It's very important to look for different sources where from we can bring in. So this way we can boost the economy and this is a very, let's see how it emerges. Will it be there to encourage philanthropy in a sense or is it just, it, 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 does it have only commercial purposes? I think whenever there's, we have to boost in philanthropy uh, and there has been effort like already the, we are trying, trying to bring in different measures but somehow it is not taken out but let's see how it pro progresses. Okay, and other social sector schemes, this time there was no big social sector focus apart from these one or two social sector schemes. So what do you think about that? Why were they missed out? You know, as I said, this budget, this, it is a continuation of what happened. And if you see the initial budget, there has been big in, uh, declarations and a lot of announcements brought in. Uh, and if you have you go to the locations, we have to see how it progresses. And that way, it is a continuation. So it is uh, one way, it's a long-term process, it a con it's a continuation process, and uh, that I think probably this is the reason, maybe not in the speech it came out, but um, the allocations really brings out much uh, clearer pictures. All right. We move forward and tell you more about the budget. So even though Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman, she presented a budget that promised large infrastructure investment, offered a rescue package for district NBFCs and allocated an unexpectedly higher 70,000 crore rupees towards recapitalization of public sector banks. But the last street has been disappointed with the budget announcements. Well, Sensex and Nifty both were down. Sensex was down by around 400 points. Nifty was also down by around a percentage point. So while the finance minister did not tinker with the long-term capital gains tax on equity as per market expectations, she did tweak the STT or securities transaction tax some bit by announcing it will now be levied only on the difference between strike price and settlement price. So a lot of expectations were there from the budget. Some of them were met, some of them were not met. And experts say some taxes on HNIs or high net worth individuals. That has not gone down well with the markets in India today. And so a lot of focus, a lot of things, farmers, affordable homes. Coming back to you, ma'am, and I would like to ask you about the affordable homes and infrastructure push, will, th will that create a lot of jobs as far as labor sector is concerned? Uh, I think for a long term, if, uh, overall, when it comes to job creation, and uh, the infrastructure sector plays a major, major role. Uh, and that way, and for a long, and it has been the housing sector or the, the real estate really was a major, and for a long term, it was not 
uh, working the way we, the performance was not great. So I think may, uh, the kind of affordable housing scheme has come up. It may not be in the bigger cities, but in tier two, tier three cities, it is going to create a more, much greater push to the overall real estate se sector, which is most important right now uh, to look in. And also it will flush in more uh, um, finances, which is very necessary right now. And if we talk about digital push, digital little, money, li little. That, 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 that is also something that was in the, in the, on the top of mind uh, of uh, PM Modi since 2014. And today also we saw that because a lot of SOPs are given by, for electric payment. Absolutely. And if you see the, the from the very mantra of this government has been Sapka Saad, Sapka Vikas. And uh, so I would say uh, the budget was li like taking money from the riches and giving it back to the poor. So, but... So this has been a right. process. Right. So let's talk about some other sectors. Let's take a look at what this year's budget offers to India's banking sector. The highlight for banking sector is definitely an infusion of rupees 70,000 crores into public sector banks. The idea behind this, of course, is to encourage banks to lend more money and thereby spur economic growth. In a speech, Finance Minister also talked about ways to strengthen the governance of PSU banks something that has come under criticism after PNB scam of 40,000 crore rupees. Having ad addressed the legacy issues, public sector banks are now proposed to be further provided 70,000 crores of rupees capital to boost credit for a strong impetus to the economy. Financial gains from cleaning of the banking system are now amply visible. NPAs, meaning non-performing assets, of commercial banks have reduced by over 1 lakh crore over the last year. Record recovery of over 4 lakh crore due to IBC and other measures has been affected in the last four years. The minister also said non-performing assets or NPAs which have been plaguing the Indian banking sector have come down in the last financial year. She said commercial banks NPAs came down by 1 lakh crore rupees while that of PSUs came down by 8. This is mostly owing to consolidation. We are talking about the coming down of the number of total banks. The finance minister also showed financially sound non-banking financial corporation NBFCs that they would continue to get funding from banks and mutual funds. The government will provide one time six months partial credit guarantee for public sector banks for the purchase of pooled assets of financially sound NBFCs. Another major announcement was regarding the housing finance companies HFCs, the regulatory authority of these housing finance companies which was formerly with the National Housing Bank, NHB, was now being returned to Reserve Bank of India.